Hey guys, so this is going to be a little bit of a programming video, sort of going over um, some changes to like my programming going forward, and it's just some general takeaways I've observed about programming each of the three lifts um, in general, like the squat, bench, and deadlift. Um, and I'm also going to show like an example of like how like programming volumes might change depending on how you get stronger. So as like a recap for this for this this last block, um, you go on my Instagram, you can you can see that I did I basically doubled. Um, Basically, we're up to 1,500 pounds, RPE 8 to 9. Um, so I did, here I did 512 for 2 at RPE 8. Um, this felt pretty good. Um, this past block, I experimented with keeping a static RPE around like an 8 the entire block. Uh, it worked out okay. Um, I definitely prefer more of a ramping RPE, ramp with a ramping RPE approach. I think this definitely did impact my deadlift a little bit more. To be honest with you, but this is like a good experiment to have. Since I, the reason why I made the choice to do a double this past block and keep it a little bit higher was just to I wanted to see if maybe I would get a little bit better um, technique practice and whatnot. Um, which I definitely think I got a little bit better. I was able to add you know a decent amount of weight at around the same RPE. Um, but in terms of like overall like pacing my progression, I definitely felt more beat up, especially like in my hips and knees. Rough than not, so going to go back to more of a ramping RPE approach, and I'll talk about that here. Um, on bench press, I did 347 for two, like RPE nine. Um, not like the best pauses. My um, left rear delt was in a lot of pain. It was from some yard work I was doing. Um, so it was like really painful just to be in that retracted position towards the bottom. Um, your scapula does have to basically move that like rear retraction and protraction throughout the bench press in order to like get, you know, the best um, leverage against the bar with your chest being high. Um, Actually, like the longer range of motion, I made some videos on this, but basically the longer the range of motion is, the more you got to be like more reliant on your scapula moving freely. But this, you know, felt pretty good. Um, and then I did 300 kilos for two at RP9 on deadlift. This wasn't like the best like technique. I wasn't really happy with like my wedge, but I was, my back felt pretty beat up from that 512 for double, which is, um, so this is also something I was pretty happy with. But there were a few things that I did this block. I tried pushing intensity a little bit harder on all my days and this like more straight sets, less of uh, down sets to see like, you know, how would I respond? I definitely did get stronger, but I definitely felt a little bit more fatigued in general. If I had to rate like my fatigue ratings on average throughout the block, it was probably around like a seven to eight. And in strength, we want to have more around a, I would say you know, about like, you know, a three to five fatigue levels. And the reason why is because when we are training for strength, we want to make sure that our fatigue is in as low of a state as possible. That's going to allow us to make progress because strength is more sensitive to to, to fatigue. Um, that's why really what the whole essence of a good powerlifting program is sort of trying to do is we're trying to get as much strength to us as possible while minimizing the fatigue. Um, and that changes as you get more advanced, you know, typically when you're a little bit like lower, um, like you're a little more, more beginner, you're weaker, you can, actually operate at a higher average intensity um, because I have a hypothesis that there's a certain volume like threshold or tonnage threshold you kind of have to hit to make adaptations um, throughout your training career. It doesn't change too much. It obviously probably goes up a little bit, but I think that it's modulated by, um, you know, strength levels. And as you get higher in strength levels, what you'll see a lot of times the stronger athletes have to operate at a lower average intensity because they're moving more more, more weight, so they're getting more volume per, 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 per set. Whereas people that are a little bit lighter or have a little bit of a lower um, strength levels, they can tend to operate at a little bit of a higher average intensity because um, they need that volume to really trigger the those adaptations. So something that I'm going to be changing going forward. So first off, for this next block, I'm going to be doing singles. I am tentatively planning on competing in November, but that's still really up in the air depending on how strong I feel. Um, I'm currently weighing around 193, 194 in the morning um, on average, um, but I want to make sure I'm substantially stronger. Like, you know, because I hit a 489 dots on my last meet, and I really want to make sure I can hit a 500 dots at this next meet. And the only way I'm going to do that realistically is by being heavier and actually filling out 198. Um, it's basically the reason why having more muscle mass on your frame increases your strength potential is mostly because you can actually have more motor neurons that innervate the actual muscle fiber and you're going to be able to get stronger that way um you know stronger nerve impulses also better leverages like i'm 5 foot 11 um you know i'm going to be better able to move and have much better leverages on all three lifts 
in general, as long as my waist size doesn't go up too much on deadlift. Um, so it's a few things I'm changing. So as a general like, rule of thumb, for most lifters, I'm talking about the big three. I made a, had a podcast with Matt Cronin on this. But what I've observed is that the squat um, and deadlift have a rather similar intensity response. Um, so squat typically on a primary day, in terms of like a, a heavy loading exposure, how I usually see most lifters I find, you know, this is about talking about it two times a week for very, very, very so like what I'm doing. Basically two harder sets that are a little more stimulative and then the rest of them, are, you know, need to be kind of more like sub six RPE. Um, week ones for my block are always like, you know, a deload or washout week or something like that, which is why, you know, you see this six and five. But usually, you know, on this primary day, we're seeing, you know, two harder sets and then a you know, pretty big drop off in load. Um, because basically, we, I'm, I'm trying to get as, a little bit more, more volume that's a little bit more recoverable. Because in general, the more volume that you can get in that, you know, you're going to have a higher magnitude of adaptation. But, you know, you don't want to have it be too high. And on my secondary day, I have like, you know, two harder, like, like basically like, like one harder top set with like a couple of easier back down sets um, or two harder sets on that day. Like squat in general, like that's why I see like two harder sets on, e on, on each day. And then deadlift, it's like one or two, um, depending on your leverages. I have a little bit better leverage for deadlift. So I usually have two heavier exposures on my primary day. Right? So I have a lot, like less well leverage dead deadlifters. I might give them like only one. And then on their secondary dairy day, again, like one and a lot off. Um, this is just as a way to get more training stimulus in without getting as fat as fatigued. Um, and then on bench press for myself, a similar structure set for bench, I found that like typically like the higher, like the harder you can train it um, from like a top set perspective and intensity perspective, the better response it tends to get. But that's, you know, depend on the, on the person. Um, typically... You know, I very rarely program in straight sets um, for my athletes because I find that's harder to recover from. It's also a little bit hard to control the average intensity. Um, it's basically on average, you know, I can basically say, I find most people fatigue, fatigue about 3% um, per squat and deadlift set, and then they fatigue about 2% on, on bench press. Um, so when I'm calculating these, these, these down sets, you know, I'm basically saying, okay, I'm probably assuming at least a 3%, you know, 6% fatigue on this with 2% from this top set. That's why you have minus 8%. And we're going to have about 3% fatigue from this as well as, you know, another 6%, which is why I just round up to 10%. And that's why, you know, you'll see these down sets. There's always a reason why I prescribe things the way that I, I, I do. Um, but again, you're kind of going to see like more of a ramping RPE approach. Um, and really on bench press, it's like, you know, I have three, like one, two, three, four, five, six heavier exposures. The rest of them are like, you know, going to be, you know, sub six RPE. And as you get stronger, that's what has to happen. You know, you have to train a little bit lighter. You very rarely will see athletes who are going to respond very well to a static RPE approach. Typically you have to have a ramping RPE approach because you're able to build more fitness adaptations, um, get stronger with less fatigue, excuse me, more room to adapt later on the block because you have, you need a longer time to like have like a five pound PR. Um, and that's, if you look at like basically high progressed loads, obviously though, this is so range. Like in my head, I have a plus or minus two, two percent. I have a post on my page two on this, like pacing progression. Like I talk about how like I set rate like, rate ranges. This is like always like plus or minus two, two percent. Um, but I'm looking here and I like, basically leading up to the end of the block where it's like, I'm looking for like a five pound ish PR on each of these lifts within, but it has to, the key is it has to be within the RPE and we want to focus on those RPE, like those ability PRs and not those like absolute one RM per PR, so they're really hard to, to recover from. And we also want to chase like the SA one, one, one rep max, for example, like uh, for my, if I have a single at 529 at nine versus like a single at like, you know, 550 at like a RPE um, 10, it's the same E1 or M. That's the difference between the both, both those like one that was just more, more f fatiguing and it just starts training with momentum. And that's why, again, I always say like, you shouldn't really max out in training you should just want to be able to keep building momentum. And usually, you know, at least keeping like one rep in, in reserve, you're going to be pr pr pretty good to to, to go. Um, yeah, this is kind of like just what I've learned about my own general training response, things that are going to be changing a little bit going forward, how progression is going to go. Again, if I feel like I'm strong enough, I'm able to meet like these ranges by the end of the, of the, of the block. I'm feeling like pretty strong and, and good. I'm going to probably compete. If not, I'm just going to go on more of an extended off season. But hopefully this is like kind of helpful with seeing like how you can 
sort of um, structured programming. Oh, one last thing I wanted to go over is I quantify volume like mostly on like a like from a systemic fatigue perspective perspective instead of like tonnage. I do it via like total like we like weekly sets. So I operate a little bit of a higher weekly set count. I usually have more of my athletes that, you know, for like strength than like a 60 to like a hundred, um, sets per week. Well, maybe it's a closer, like, um, 60 day to 80. The only reason why I have this little bit of a higher volume is just because I train seven days a week and you can train seven days a week and get stronger. Um, you just had to pace out your training the way I've been training seven days a week for the past like three years. So it's not anything new to me, but you can kind of see how, you know, like in general, like this is how I calculate like systemic, like fatigue because again we we're kind of going into sessions like you know it becomes a part of like how much weekly work are we doing and what's the average intensity on those sessions like how hard are, are the sets and and whatnot and we want to find a you know a volume and intensity amount where i would say the athlete feels subjectively you know say like you know a, a five out of ten on the, on the recovery scale like, you know you feel pretty good most of the time so you got some work in but you know you're you're excited to, to train you want to avoid you know anything like above a seven as much as we possibly can. Um, if there's a more of a recovery cost, there's more of an injury risk. Um, that actually, of all the of all the things that sort of are measures of like fit, like fit, fit, fatigue and like recovery, like number one thing that actually we can use by saying how recovered or how fatigued are you is, and this is an athletes that like to train is the desire to train. Like if you do not want to come in and lift at all, you're probably really beat up. And so usually I look at you know, number one is average intensity in the right spot um, for most lifters, which is going to be usually with the ramping RPE approach of like, you know, being within a six to an eight front for the average of the block on a top set in, 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 in intensity. And then we'll look at systemic overall workload and distribution of that workload. So, you know, if somebody is feeling really beat up from squatting, you know, maybe I do them a little bit less squats and I give them more accessory work. I actually had a conversation with Charlie Dixon earlier to, to, to today. Um, where we, he talked about his training approach and you can kind of just see like he, Charlie squats like upper sixes. Um, and he benches like, you know, 400 and he deadlifts, you know, upper sixes too. And you can see how there's not a lot of volume here actually on his uh, you know, specificity, especially for somebody like Charlie who has struggled with being a little bit more injury free. And this is like where you might see, okay, a little bit less in the volume. Cause he's not really so strong uh, on the, on the big three. And he also is as resilient to, to injuries. That's why, he might just say, okay, like, this is why he has more of a, a structure kind of like, like, like this. Um, so hopefully this is helpful. Just like a little bit of practical takeaways for your programming. Um, if you guys are interested in coaching, um, links down below. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one.